large field within robotics of developmental robotics that tries to do uh, exactly that. Most of my research falls within the field of evolutionary robotics where we're trying to replicate an evolutionary trajectory where our algorithm can evolve or start with simple body plans and simple neural controllers and gradually complexify the phenotypes, so both the body and brain, to eventually realize some uh, useful behavior that we could download and execute on a physical machine. Um, I and some others have created even more complex algorithms that combine evolution and development where you're evolving the tra developmental trajectories themselves. Right? So again, this begs the question of why would we want to include all this additional algorithmic complexity if our ultimate goal is an engineering goal, which is just to realize some uh, machine, some adaptive machine that can carry out useful behavior in the real world. So I'm going to offer uh, some evidence today, some new evidence we've generated in my lab to try and answer uh, this question. I'm sure there's lots of lines of evidence uh, that I've missed, and again, I hope in the discussion we can try and generate some additional uh, arguments for why we want to try and evolve or develop our machines. Okay, so I very quickly want to go through six lines of evidence. I'm not going to go into much detail about those and then f uh, focus in the last part of the ta talk on the seventh uh, and eighth reason. Most of these lines of evidence have already been summarized uh, in the book that uh, Rolf and I co-authored called How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. One of the ways that morphology or changing morphology or evolving morphology is useful can be summarized as it helps to simplify control. And this is sort of the basic idea that as we're trying to optimize some behavior, we can trade off morphology against control. These are some videos from uh, my PhD work in, in Rolf's lab. Uh, where we're evolving these creatures to push the block in their environment. You'll notice very quickly they're not very good at it. This one up here is an ancestor robot that learns to move towards the uh, object using peristaltic motion or this inchworm type method of locomotion. This is a descendant of the one up here. Uh, this evolutionary process has realized that I always place the block in the same place, uh, so it doesn't actually need to locomote towards the object. It can just grow this long front appendage and exert force uh, against it. So this is a typical run, not a particularly successful run, but what was interesting about this run is if you break open these evolved body plans, in particular this front appendage, and look at the neural architecture that evolution has discovered, it's conserved across the ancestor and descendant robot. And this is a cartoon from our book that tries to illustrate what this control policy does. So here's the tip of the front appendage in both the ancestor and descendant moving back uh, towards the main body, which is over here. You find uh, that there is a distributed neural mo motif uh, distributed along the length of this appendage where we have a tactile sensor that innervates a motor in the unit behind it. And that pattern or that motif is then copied along the length of the appendage. There's no centralized control or centralized timing. It's a distributed solution. Not only is it distributed, but they're independent. They're not explicitly talking to one another, these different motifs. Because these robots were evolved and behave in this physically realistic environment, there's weight, inertia, uh, friction, and so on, because of the mass distribution, the tip tends to come in contact with the ground first, which causes the motor to fire in the unit behind, which rotates the tip upward. That combined weight of the front two units then causes the second unit to come into contact with the ground, which fires the motor behind, and so on, and so on. And you get this coordinated motion, which can be exploited for locomotion or for rudimentary manipulation. So again, this is a relatively simple controller. There is no internal dynamics. It's a simple direct connection from sensors to motors. But again, evolution tends to find uh, solutions that we might not have thought of, and often they're simpler than what a human engineer might have come up with. If you want to create locomotion or manipulation, you might think of central timing and try and control, control the movement along this uh, appendage. Uh, so that's one line of reasoning. Another one is that morphology tends to ease tasks. We've heard about computer vision. Uh, I know Giorgio was here earlier. Uh, together with Paul Fis Fitzpatrick, they gave a very nice uh, robot demonstration of the primacy of manipulation uh, in vision and object manipulation and recognition. Uh, as we all know, image segmentation is a relatively difficult task if it's approached purely computationally. But if we assume we have a robot with a particular body and it's able to reach out and 
manipulate objects in its field of view, image segmentation or object uh, segmentation becomes much easier. Okay, so bringing in morphology and manipulation eases seemingly difficult tasks that are seen from a purely computational point of view. Okay, a third one 